Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 1 Episode 3 Replacements has finally been released on Disney Plus and with it we were given a deep look into how the Empire began to transition away from the clone troopers, moving into a hybrid of clone and natural born squads before they are eventually phased out for good. The episode was packed full of connections to the Star Wars films, books, comics and games, including an absolutely massive tie-in to Rogue One, so let's break them all down. Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe for more awesome Star Wars lore content. So the episode begins on board the Bad Batch's ship, the Havoc Marauder, where Echo notes that ever since escaping Solukamai, several of their ship systems have been glitching because of the ship guard system there. Echo wants to begin repairing the ship, but Tech tells him that figuring out the true effectiveness of their inhibitor chips has to take priority. Moments after this, their conversation is quickly cut off as their ship is pulled right out of hyperspace, sending them hurling towards a nearby moon. This understandably terrifies Omega as she straps in, and Rekka doesn't make the situation any better. He's definitely not used to having a kid around. Eventually they do manage to safely touch down, but one of their capacitors has blown, meaning they won't be able to take off without replacing it. Trying to be helpful to the group, Omega goes rummaging through their items and eventually pulls out Crosshair's weapon kit, which leads the group into a massive debate over whether or not his actions were influenced by his chip, which we of course know thanks to Fives in the clone conspiracy arc, that the chip is almost completely at fault, but of course there is still a little bit of Crosshair still in there. Following this we cut back to Kamino, where the Empire are conducting more experiments on Crosshair. Thankfully we also discover that AZ survived his little encounter with the clone trooper from not too long ago, and seems to have made a full recovery, possibly having his programming slightly changed to follow orders better. The clone's blaster was set to stun, but with droids you never know what can go wrong with their circuits. After completing a scan on Crosshair's head, Vice Admiral Rampart, who was of course the man we saw in the hologram on Seleucomai, enters the room, and is commended by Tarkin for his rapid implementation of the chain code system. The chain codes were of course a major piece in The Mandalorian, and we even got a good look at Boba Fett's, which canonized a lot of his old backstory, including Jasta Maril and Jango's story. Following this, Tarkin then asks Rampart about the status of Project War Mantle, which is actually one of the projects that was being stored in the Imperial Vault on Scarif, and one that Jyn Erso listed off while searching for the Death Star plans in Rogue One. And just to give you a refresher on the other top secret Imperial projects stored at Scarif, they included Project Stardust, which contained the Death Star plans, then Stellar Sphere, Mark Omega, which I must say is now very suspiciously named, having this new context with the Bad Batch, then Pax Aurora, Cluster Prism, and finally Black Saber, which will probably be very relevant now with The Mandalorian Season 3 coming soon, and might explain how Gideon got the Saber. This is a major connection to Rogue One, and squarely points to the fact that Project War Mantle is related to the creation of the Death Troopers, which we'll get more into in a second. Following this, Rampart introduces the first ever group of enlisted Imperial Elite Troopers, who will serve under Crosshair. Rampart believes that instead of going for a fully cloned army or a fully enlisted army, in order to keep the Empire strong, there should be a combination of the two in the early stages, before eventually phasing the clone troopers completely out. Just looking at their armor, it's becoming more and more clear that these guys will be the first generation of proto death troopers, and will probably evolve into the death troopers we see later down the line in Rebels and Rogue One. And a lot of people have been saying that one of the Imperial troopers here could be Iden Versio from the Battlefront games. I can definitely see the similarities, but it doesn't really seem like the ages match up to make this work. But let me know in the comments down below what you think. Back on the moon with Clone Force 99, Tech and Echo begin repairing the ship, but are quickly pulled away from the ship when they notice a large amount of eggs, and even some very deep scratch marks on the ship. Very unsettling. Now this creature that they are hunting is called the Ordo Moon Dragon. This probably refers to the homeworld of the Mandalorian clan Ordo from the Knights of the Old Republic game. We have actually had Ordo show up in canon before, with the crime lord Dryden Voss stealing an ancient Mandalorian Rally Master Lance for his collection, which you can actually see in Solo, a Star Wars story. Following this, Hunter gathers the Bad Batch to go and fix this little problem, and Omega badly wants to join Hunter in catching the fierce beast. Understandably, the group are hesitant to let her go into such a dangerous situation, but she insists and Hunter takes her with him. Omega is incredibly excited to join Hunter in catching this creature. Very concerningly, Rekka also seems to be having a lot of pain in his head. This comes as a result of the crash landing that we saw when they arrived on the moon, but it is very worrying, because this is in the exact same spot where the clone inhibitor chips are placed. The amount of time they spent on this scene, and Hunter continually asking Rekka if he's alright, is pointing to something bad happening in the next few episodes. That device that Tech was working on at the start of the episode will surely come into play here, and might help save Rekka if his chip does end up activating because of the crash. <laughs> Let's just hope he stays away from Amiga if the chip activates. Back on Kamino, we cut back to the new Imperial recruits, who begin arguing about how there is no war left to fight, wondering why they are even here. But one of them speaks up and tells the rest that the Empire pay him and feed him well, more than the Republic ever did. 
And this really shows you that the Republic certainly weren't the good guys to everyone. The Republic had a deep problem with corruption and not looking after the regular citizens. That's the whole reason the Separatists tried to break away in the first place. The enlisted troopers led by Crosshair are then sent off back to Onderon to finally wipe out Saw Gerrera and his partisans where Clone Force 99 failed. While the debate between the enlisted troopers and the clone troopers goes on between Tarkin and Rampart, Lama Su is outraged that the Empire is turning their backs on them and is clearly beginning to plan something for their own protection. And we all know that this resulted in the clone rebellion in Legends, where anti-clones were bred to fight the Empire. So I think we're heading down this very dark path already. Back on the moon, Hunter is using his tracking skills through his enhancement to hunt down the beast from earlier, and Omega is extremely fascinated, picking up the grainy dirt just like she did on Seleucami. Omega then asks Hunter if she can learn to track just like him, but Hunter tells her that it's his enhanced skill, which leads him to list the enhancements of the other members of Clone Force 99, leaving out Crosshair. Omega tells Hunter not to brush Crosshair off and not to blame him for flipping, since he can't control it. Moving to Onderon, one of the enlisted troopers begins to taunt Crosshair for being a clone and tells him that all of the clones will soon be phased out, which of course does not make the sniper happy. They then arrive on Onderon, alerting Saw's rebels and leading to an all-out firefight where many unfortunately die. Following this, Crosshair does something completely shocking, executing a surrendered fighter before putting his finger on the trigger to kill four civilians. The enlisted troopers are shocked and disgusted at Crosshair, telling him that they signed up to be soldiers, not executioners. The modifications they must have made to Crosshair's chip are absolutely horrendous. After this, Crosshair goes a step further, executing one of his own men in cold blood for failing to follow orders, before turning around and ordering the others to execute the civilians, which at this point they have no choice but to comply. We can be sure that this is the inhibitor chip causing these actions since Crosshair recites good soldiers follow orders before executing his own man. There were many war crimes committed on Onderon by the Empire here, which is nothing new, but to see the orders directly coming from Crosshair really shows you just how much an inhibitor chip can alter a clone trooper's mind. His actions were also very much in line with the Tarkin Doctrine, which basically states that to rule effectively you must rule by fear. Of course, the Tarkin Doctrine wasn't official until five years after the creation of the Empire, but we know that Tarkin has been thinking this way for almost his entire life. Absolutely chilling to see it passed down to Crosshair. Back on Kamino, Tarkin is impressed with Crosshair Squad and has very high hopes for Project War Mantle in the future. The Kaminoans on the other hand are becoming increasingly nervous that their operation will soon cease to exist, and for this reason, they want to immediately move away from the Jango Fett genome to one of an enhanced clone trooper like those of Clone Force 99 or Omega. This ties into the Kamino Rebellion and the Kamino Uprising, which is looking more and more likely every episode. It could also mean that the Scar Squadron, also known as Task Force 99, are actually enhanced clones of Clone Force 99. If you just look at them, they each have a counterpart to the members of the Bad Batch, and even a possible counterpart to Omega. So we'll have to see what they do with Task Force 99. Following this, Crosshair takes the remaining members of his squad back to their barracks, which happens to be the same barracks that he and his brothers from Clone Force 99 were previously using. It's sad to see him in there without his brothers. And to end the story, we go back to the Havoc Marauder, where Rekka has a surprise for Omega, telling her to close her eyes. As she walks to the back of the ship, she sees that Rekka has created a room for her, something she never had before on Kamino. Now she is officially a member of Clone Force 99. So that was my full breakdown of Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 1 Episode 3 Replacements. Thanks so much for watching, really hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers guys, hope to see you in the next one.